ways smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out, of, coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What shall we do then, the crowd asked. John answered, the man with two tunics should share with him who has none, and the one who has food shall do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he, to he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come. The thongs of, those san of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire and with many other words John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them this is the word of the Lord It's always funny when um, you come to preach and the Lord has been working behind the scenes and how bits of the service are all slightly resonating, even with your testimony a few moments ago. It's really encouraging that the Lord is with us. This is, the, um, this is the set reading for the third Sunday of Advent. I'm not specifically going to use all of it today um, as I preach, but just want to take some broad themes raised in today's passage. Um, specifically preparing the way for Jesus. In today's passage, we hear that crowds of people from all sorts of backgrounds were coming to G John the Baptist with questions. These were people seeking the Lord, and they were also drawn to John's holiness. John's ministry was to prepare people's hearts for the coming of the Messiah. We too at Christchurch seek answers to questions. What plans does the Lord have for Christchurch? What kind of church does the Lord want us to be? Who's going to be our new vicar? In what ways do we need to take our holiness more seriously? And how do we prepare for the future at Christchurch? These are big questions. How are we to seek the answer to these questions? In a way, we already have begun this process. One way we have started doing this is through prayer. We're doing lots of this at Christ Church. We're doing this through the intercession prayer group and the ministry leadership team, MLT, that meets up once a month. I also know that the seeking of answers from the Lord is taking place within weekly small groups. And we've seen this as me and Steve have gone around visiting some of the home groups. I'm also aware that individuals are also seeking the Lord through their own private dev um, devotionals and prayer times at home. The church has also been meeting corporately, corporately on Tuesdays every six or so weeks to seek answers from God. I think it's fair to say that Christ Church has entered a season of seeking the Lord and hungering and thirsting more for God's presence here at Christ Church. 
but also in our own individual lives. The Lord encourages his people to, spe- uh, to seek him out. And Isaiah 55 is just full of phrases from the Lord inviting the thirsty and hung- hungry to come near to him. I'm just going to read out a couple of verses. Verse 1, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. Later on it says, Listen, listen to me, and eat What is good? In many respects, that could be God's word. He goes on to say, Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. And verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. The Lord is near, and he is called Emmanuel, God with us. Now, one of the ways that God's people seek the Lord more deeply is through fasting. I've read recently a number of books about revival. And this is on the back of of morning seminars that I attended at this year's New Wine. The seminar, the particular one I was drawn to, was called Set Me on Fire by Malcolm MacDonald. And one of the key features of that time of revival is prayer and fasting. And this was very much echoed by the experiences um, of one of those who experienced such a revival on the island Isle of Lewis between 1945 and 52. To quote one of those who experienced it, he goes on to say, God's people were waiting and longing just as they were at Pentecost, united and waiting for the coming of the Lord in their midst. So how about us at Christ Church? Do we have a sense of that longing and waiting for revival here in Bushmead? Are we willing to be united and wait for the coming of the Lord in our midst? So what is fasting? Fasting is voluntarily going without food or any other regular, regularly enjoyed good gift from God. So it's not necessarily always food. It's for, some, it's for, um, for the sake of some spiritual purpose. Fasting is the stretching of our hearts and often an expression of our discontent, discontent with our sinful selves, the pain and trouble around us, and a longing for more of Christ. Are we discontented here at Christ Church, perhaps with our sinful selves, perhaps the pain and trouble we see and experience? When Jesus returns, fasting will be done. It is a temporary measure for this life and age to enrich our joy in Jesus and prepare our hearts for the next for seeing him face to face. When Jesus returns, he will not call a fast, but he will throw a feast. Now I have kind of, um, these notes will be um, emailed out um, today or tomorrow. There's a range of things here I'd like you to sort of consider. Um, and, but there are some paper copies on the desk outside if um, you'd like to, to take away. There'll be a number of scriptures here which you may want to kind of look at. So why do God's people fast? Well, there's three general areas and reasons. The first one is to express repentance. The first most common and perhaps most fundamental type of fast is for, as I said, Repentance. Think of it as an inward um, activity, God's people realizing their sin, typically not small indiscretions or lapses in judgment, but deep and prolonged rebellion. And then they come and seek forgiveness from the Lord. There's a number of scriptures, 1 Samuel 7, I'm not going to list them out, Um, they'll be in the notes that will be sent out um, tomorrow. The second main reason is to grieve hard providences. 
Fasting gives voice to the pain and sorrow of sudden, severe, outward circumstances and represented a heart of faith towards God in the midst of great tragedies. One of them can be found in sort of Samuel 2, when the news of King Saul's death reached David and his men. And the scripture says, they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan, his son, and for the people of the Lord. So it's kind of a cry out in the midst of real pain and tragedy. The third general area is to seek God's favor. This is a forward kind of fast, not in response to sin within or grief without, but more proactive in the sense of asking for the Lord's guidance or future favor. And there's a great passage in 2 Chronicles 20, in which is a plea for God's direction. It goes on to say, we do not know, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I shall say that again. That's 2 Chronicles 20. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you, Lord. That is a piece of scripture that should really resonate here at Christ Church. In God's Chosen Fast by Arthur Wallace, he writes, when a person is willing to set aside the legitimate at appetite of the body to concentrate on the work of praying, they are demonstrating that they mean business, that they are seeking with all their heart and will not let go of God until he answers. The thought of fasting has been an expression or is an expression of wholeheartedness. And this was very much in, in a passage by Joel when he says, Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart with fasting. So it's a looking towards the Lord. That's where our gaze is, our focus. Fasting helps to express, to deepen, and to confirm the resolution that we are ready to sacrifice anything to sacrifice ourselves, to attain what we seek for the kingdom of God. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. And that's Ezra 8. This may be just me, so the wider church needs to test and weigh what I'm about to say, but I can't help but feel that during this season at Christ Church, that the Lord is calling us to go deeper, to go deeper into him. And I think there's been echoes of this, not just from myself, but the various other things like ministry leadership team and intercessions. I don't think the Lord is satisfied with our relationship. He wants to bless us. And he wants us to come closer. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. This is a process. It's an invitation to firstly ask. Ask of our Heavenly Father through prayer. But then he doesn't stop there. Then push a little harder by seeking Step two. And then we are to really press in by knocking on the door. Isn't this, isn't this what it's like to seek and return to the Lord with all your heart? There are many big ch um, challenges and changes that are taking place at Christ Church at the moment. What is our Lord saying to us during, during this season? Do we want to be ready for these changes by aligning ourselves with God's vision for Christ Church? It is for this reason that the church's PCC agreed to, call, um, agreed to a core to fast. 
Now, some of you will know between January um, the 7th of January, Monday the 7th of January to Thursday the 10th, Christ Church will be holding a joint evening of prayer whereby the church is invite, invited to come together and pray, pray corporately for the needs of the church and to seek his face. And starting the year is quite a good thing to do that. And, and again, that was encouraged by um, members of the church at the new, uh, new wine season, um, conference this year. So it's kind of a concerted kind of focus on the Lord with prayer. And so we are asking the church to prayerfully consider fasting for a small time during that period. We are not necessarily asking the church to fast throughout that whole period unless the Lord is specifically calling you to do this. If, if this is the case, please can you speak to myself or Steve Brooks, the church wardens, just to help you make sure that the Lord is saying that, because that's quite a serious thing. So hopefully you're still with me. Whenever you talk about fast, people kind of like, mm. actually, I have heard sermons on fasting before, and I know exactly what my response was. Um, exactly. So, <laughs> right. So, hopefully, you're kind of with me still. Um, okay, before I talk about how to fast, can I just ask that you do not switch off, as I said, and automatically discount what I'm about to say. Fasting is challenging. And in a way, that's the point. People get very nervous about fasting, and I think that's understandable. I want to make this relatively simple and relatively easy to start with. And I think we need to be, I invite you to be open to what God may be saying to, to us as a church and to let him teach us step by step to fast. So I don't necessarily think this is about jumping straight in, especially um, for many people, this may be a completely sort of new activity. This, this joke almost um, competes with Andrew's. Let us not rush and take on more than we can chew. <laughs> or not in this case. So let us not rush in. I just invite the church to be open. And what is he saying? And allowing the Lord to teach us. What is he saying? Let's just go through some of the basics about fasting. Number one, start small. Don't go from no fasting to attempting a week-long fast. Start with fasting perhaps one meal during the week of prayer, if you are new to fasting. Then if you believe that the Lord has placed on your heart to go further, perhaps fast one meal a week for several weeks, perhaps two, and perhaps a whole day. Take it slowly. Walk with God through this. Let him teach you how to fast. A juice fast means abstaining from all foods and beverages except for juice and water. It's allowing yourself, allowing yourself juice provides nutrients and sugar for the body to keep on operating while still feeling the effects of going without food. It is not recommended that you abstain from water during, any, um, fa well, during a fast of any time. And there's no reason to suggest that actually Jesus did not abstain water during his 40 diet days either. It talks about food. Number two, plan what you'll do instead of eating. Fasting isn't merely an act of self-deprivation or deprivation, but a spiritual discipline for seeking more of God's fullness. Which means we should plan, we should have a plan for what positive pursuit to undertake in the time we normally take to eat. As we will be praying as a church, that would be a good replacement. 
But if you decide to fast during the future, then it's recommended that you plan when you will spend time with the Lord and what you, would, what you will be doing. So that may be prayer. It may be meditating on his word. But it could also be putting on some worship music and praising the Lord. That would be, you know, the Lord would like that. I'd love to hear your voice singing to him. A fast without spending time with God is simply a secular fast, which is actually quite trendy at the moment. Consider how your fast will affect others. It's not a license to be unloving. And if you have regular lunches or dinners with people, assess how your abstaining will affect them and let them know ahead of time instead of just being a no-show or springing it upon them. Try different kind of fast fasts. The typical form of fasting is personal, it's private, and it's partial. But there are other varieties in the Bible. They can be personal and communal. They can be congregational. They can be national, and there have been times when the nation has called for a fast. It's very hard to imagine that ever happening again, to be honest. Um, Although, Lord, may I be wrong in that. They can be regular and occasional, absolute or partial, family, small group, or church. So there's a number of ways we can kind of do this. We can also fast something other than food. Fasting from food is not necessarily for everyone. Some health conditions keep even the most devout from traditional food fasts. So we need to be wise and sensible. And for some people, it just doesn't, it would not be right. You kind of know your, your own needs and your own health. So fast is not limited to abstaining from food. Martin Lloyd-Jones said that fasting should re really be a Sorry, fasting should really be made to include abstinence from anything which is legitimate in and of itself for the sake of some special spiritual purpose. If it's not wise for you to fast food, then consider fasting television, compu the computer, um, going to the gym, social media, or any other regular enjoyment that bend your heart towards greater enjoyment of Jesus. Be careful of fasting tea and coffee. Some of you already know that. <laughs> um, because it is actually quite painful and very difficult. I know this, and, I tr <laughs> and some of you do as well. It is recommended, if you're going to give up caffeine, that you wean yourself off over a couple of weeks um, before you decided to fully give it up. Again, there's a bit of wisdom here. And can I gently suggest that we, can I um, gently suggest that we can all fast a little more challenging, challengingly, other than chocolate and biscuits? <laughs> remember it's about seeking and returning to the Lord and I think the Lord is worth more than biscuits and chocolate a final note the PCC and church leadership are not going to hold people accountable on whether or not they are fasting in fact it would be wrong to do that biblically this is about you and the Lord, and it is a private matter. We also don't want people to be boastful about their fasting. In the Old Testament, God and, and Jesus in the New Testament were very disapproving of those who fasted for the praise of their fellow men and women. Please, can I ask the church to individually um, be pr individually prayerfully seek the Lord as to whether and how he would like you to fast. In Isaiah 58, God reminds his people that an acceptable fast is one that he has chosen, he has initiated, 
initiated and which is focused upon him. Fasting like the gospel isn't for the self-sufficient and those who feel that they have it all together. It's for the poor in spirit. It's for those who mourn. It's for the meek. For those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. In other words, fasting is for Christians. Christ needs God's help as we move into the future. Let us let each of us consider a fast to show the Lord that we take him and his will more seriously. Amen. If you want any f- further conversations about this, please speak to me at the end. And um, yeah, we can talk about it then. Thank you.